Um, our next speaker is Professor Janice Robertson, um, Professor and the James Hunter Family Chair in ALS Research at the University of Toronto. And Janice gained a PhD at the King's College London in the UK, followed by a fellowship at McGill University over to Canada, Montreal, and started a lab in 2004 at the TAN Centre for Research in Neurogenerative Disease at the University of Toronto. And her focus is identifying new treatments through understanding of the molecular mechanisms of disease. Thank you. Over to you, Janice. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today. And thank you, Nick, for that very kind introduction. Today, I'm going to be talking about the science behind the treatments, how we get there. When you receive a therapy in the clinic, there's a tremendous amount of research that goes into the development of these therapies. And I just want to describe a little bit about the steps that we've had to go through to achieve this goal. The example I'm going to use today is the therapies are currently in clinical trials for superoxide dismutase 1, the antisense therapies. And how we've gone from when the mutations were first identified in 1993, taking us all the way through to the clinical trials that we have now in 2020. So the first mutations for ALS, for any form of ALS, were identified in 1993 and they were mutations in superoxide dismutase 1. But just to give you a little bit of an understanding of how this was found, it actually arcs back to genetics, which was originally done by Mendel in 1866. And then there was the discovery of DNA by Watson and Crick in 1953, for which they won the Nobel Prize. And then technologies uh, such as polymerized chain reaction, for which Mollison Smith earned the Nobel Prize in 1984. And this technique depended on the discovery of a bacteria that was found in hot springs called Thermus aquaticus that gave us one of the reagents called TAC polymerase, which allows us to actually manipulate genes and to identify these mutations. So this type of research was completely crucial to us identifying genetic mutations for ALS and for other diseases. So once the mutations in SLD1 were identified, then we had to look back and find if people had actually ever studied this protein. In fact, it was first described in 1969 by McCord and Fedovich, who have done quite a bit of work on SLD1. And this was fundamental to our understanding of how these mutations could potentially cause ALS. One of the first things that the scientists had to do was to generate animal models. These animal models are crucial for us to understand how these mutant genes, when expressed in these models, actually cause the disease. And the first model, the first mouse model that was generated expressing mutated forms of SOD1 was developed in 1994. And again, the technologies that provided the ability to be able to generate these mouse models came from Minson Janish in 1974, who were actually the first people who ever made transgenic mouse models. And since that time, there's been tremendous advances in how we make these types of models. But this led to the ability to be able to create an SOD1 transgenic mouse model. And these mouse models have been vital for us to understand the mechanistic basis of the disease. One of the first things was, that was discovered was that the mutations in SOD1, and SOD1 is an enzyme that's involved in removing free radicals, is that these mutations do not cause a loss of the normal function of SOD1. In fact, what happens is that these mutations cause the protein to adopt an abnormal gain of toxic function. Subsequent studies to try to understand what this toxic gain of function could be have led to scientists, thousands of scientists around the world, looking at mechanisms of the disease using these mouse models and other models. And certain pathways have been identified, such as glutamate cytotoxicity, in which the basis of one of the first drugs that was ever used for the treatment of ALS, Williazole, was developed. Endoplasmic reticulum stress, mitochondrial dysfunction, oxidative stress, bioenergetic defects, and axonal transport defects. And scientists, thousands of scientists, have been working on these particular pathways and are still doing this today. And this actually informs us on other forms of ALS as well. 
A pivotal finding was in 1998 that the mutations in SOD1 caused the protein to aggregate, and this was shown in mice. Here we can see uh, uh, some tissue from an animal, from a spinal cord, from a mouse expressing a mutant form of SOD1. And this brown staining, this ugly brown staining here in this big round inclusion here is actually aggregated SOD1. Subsequently, it was found that the mutations in SOD1 caused the protein to misfold. And just to put this in a little bit more context, I'll just put my picture off here just for a minute, is if we imagine a piece of paper. This piece of paper can be folded as such uh, into different shapes. And this folding is important for the function of that protein. So you can see we have these different shapes here that can be produced from the same piece of paper. But you have certain shapes that are absolutely required for the normal function of the protein. What happens in ALS is that the mutations in the SOD1 protein cause the protein to become misfolded. So here we have a normally folded protein, and here we have an abnormally misfolded protein. And this is what the mutations in SOD1 cause the protein to do. These misfolded forms of SOD1 accumulate together, and these form aggregates. And this is what we see in the disease. This misfolded aggregated SOD1 through numerous studies from labs across the world have been shown to actually cause the neurons to die. So this folding or misfolding of SOD1 into these structures and the formation of these aggregates, this is just what's causing the motor neurons to die and is the early steps in causing ALS. So when we look at the normal SOD1 protein here, I've uh, represented it here as this kind of linear strand. And then in SOD1, when you have mutations in the protein, it causes it to misfold. And we have lots of SOD1 in our cells. And here we have representations of all these different SOD1 molecules within the cell. And within ALS, these SOD1 molecules form these aggregates. They misfold and they aggregate. So one of the key therapeutic strategies that's come from the science behind this understanding that these mutations are acting through causing the protein to misfold and aggregate is that if we reduce the amount of SOD1 protein, if we have less SOD1 protein, then we will have less aggregates. And this has been a key therapeutic strategy that's led to the antisense therapies. So here we have the idea, if we reduce the levels of SOD1, the input into forming these aggregates, then we will reduce the overall number of SOD1 aggregates and that this will have therapeutic benefit. And so this led to the first uh, clinical trial, or the first testing in animals, I should say, using antisense oligonucleotides to knock down SOD1. That was in 2006. This work came from study that was actually developed in 1978, when the first antisense oligonucleotides were done by Zen Zencheck and Stevenson. To provide this technology, they allowed us through the years to actually develop it for the use for targeting mutated forms of SOD1. In 2007, it was found that this misfolding of SOD1 actually does occur in SOD1 cases uh, caused by mutations in SOD1. And this is what the misfolded, aggregated SOD1 looks like in motor neurons of people who have carried different types of mutations of SOD1. And all this brown staining here is this aggregated, misfolded SOD1, basically garbage built up in the cell. And the idea is that if we can prevent the formation of this garbage, this buildup, then this will provide therapeutic benefit. And in fact, this has been shown through immunotherapeutic targeting of misfolded SOD1. So if you actually use uh, immune approaches, you can remove this misfolded SOD1, and this can provide therapeutic benefit in the mouse models. But of course, when we think about immunotherapies and immunizations, and we're very aware of it these days with COVID, the first description of an immunization actually came from China, Wang Quan, who lived from 1499 to 1582. Then we are aware of Jenner, who developed the smallpox vaccine. And then probably more in recent memory is Joseph Salk, who developed the polio vaccine in 1955. So all of this uh, research expertise has been there for many, many years, which allows these types of studies to be advanced in ALS. 
Interestingly, in 2010, it was discovered that this misfolded SLD1 can be detected in sporadic ALS patients as well, which suggests potentially that therapies targeting misfolded SLD1 would not only work in cases caused by mutations in SLD1, but potentially, we don't know for sure yet, could potentially have a benefit in people with sporadic ALS. In uh, 2013, there was the first phase one clinical trial of the SOD1 antisense therapy that was originally tested in animals in 2006. So this was primarily a safety trial to make sure that if you knock down SOD1 in a human being, that this does not have negative consequences. And it looked like it was tolerable and it was safe. In a study in 2018, where there's been more advances in the development of more sophisticated SOD1 antisense oligonutrient type therapies, it was found that when this was treated with these types, there was an extension of survival in SOD1s, SOD1 transgenic mice. And importantly, it was shown that this actually lowered the levels of SOD1 itself. And as I'd mentioned, if you can lower the levels of SOD1, then you can lower the levels of misfolded aggregated SOD1 and provide therapeutic benefit. Then excitingly, in 2020, there was the report that's been going on for the last couple of years. There was a phase one, two clinical trial using Torfersen, which was developed by Ionis Therapeutics and also licensed by Biogen, who are actually sponsoring this meeting here today. We thank them very much. And uh, this SOD1 therapy has been tested in patients who carry the SOD1 mutation. And very importantly, it's been shown to lower SOD1 levels. And so the results of this also depended on biomarker studies to actually see whether or not we could have a readout of the therapeutic benefit. One of the uh, reagents that was used for this was neurofilament biomarkers. And here again, we can see that this came from work that was actually done in 1996, originally actually started in the 1980s. And this fed into providing these uh, results from the clinical trials. We're awaiting the results from the phase three clinical trials. Results are looking uh, optimistic. We're very excited by this, uh, using these antisense therapies. But I have to say that there are a number of other therapies in the pipeline, uh, gene therapies, microRNA, short hairpin RNAs, these immunotherapies that I was talking about. This new technology, CRISPR-Cas9, for which um, the founders of this technology received the Nobel Prize this year. And then we have, I'm sure you've all heard of the Healy trials and the discovery perhaps of this uh, combination therapy, therapy called Amelix. And so we have this to look forward to um, the results of in the next little while. But I just want to point out that, you know, when we get to these therapies, we had all these milestones through the discovery of SOD1, what its function is normally, what the mutations do. They don't affect the normal function of the protein. They're causing a gain of a toxic function that's related to the aggregation of this protein. The protein becomes misfolded. And this misfolded SOD1 is what causes the motor neurons to die. So if we can prevent the formation of the misfolded SOD1, this will have therapeutic benefit. So the de development of ALS therapies, as I've shown here, requires multi-disciplines. There's geneticists, chemists, biologists, microbiologists, biophysicists, immunologists, animal modelers, and the clinicians who are actually testing these therapies. And I have to say that this is a collaborative effort between scientists across the world. And to develop these therapies is absolutely crucial for research. Research is key to developing therapies for ALS, not just SOD1 ALS, from which we've learned an awful lot, but there are other genetic forms. And importantly, also we learn a great deal about sporadic forms of the disease. So I'd like to thank my laboratory. I'd like to thank the James Hunter Family ALS Initiative for supporting our research. And I'd also give a big shout out to ALS Canada who have been supporting ALS in this country for a number of years. Thank you very much. Thank you.